just have about a month left in this book that has served us and inspired us and revealed the Lord to us. So Philippians chapter 4 this morning, verses 8 and 9, verses 8 and 9 of Philippians chapter 4. And let's remember as we read that this is God's word, this is God speaking to us, this is God, in this case, commanding us lovingly, but commanding us, calling us to something, and we want to respond humbly and graciously and eagerly, just as we would instruct our children to respond, yes, daddy, or yes, mommy, we want to respond, yes, Lord, as we receive the commands of his words. Let's begin reading Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, If there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Lord, anoint the preaching of this word. It's just sort of understood at this point in my life with my friends, especially on the pastoral team, that if we are going to drive anywhere, I will not be the one driving. We don't even talk about it much anymore. It's just an assumption. Um, It's one of those things uh, just like you just wouldn't have certain people uh, work on your car. You just don't have me drive your car. Um, that's because one of the reasons, there's many reasons actually, you could, if you want the guys to give you a list, they could. But one of the reasons uh, is that I, I'm sure there are people that are lazier or more passive uh, in directionality, but I, I'm not sure I've met them. I'm sure they're out there. But I tend to be very, very poor at directions. I forget where things are. I'm not sure where we are. Um, I forget how we got there. Actually, just the other day, Bart and I were driving uh, over one of the college campuses to look into a facility for rental, and I told Bart on the way in from the parking lot, you need to remember where this car is right now. Uh, And sure enough, when we got into the building, we'd been there five minutes or, you know, very short period of time, I started to walk out the wrong door as we were, <laughs> as we were leaving. So I'm, I'm just not very good uh, at directions. Thankfully, I have a wife, so we get places. And God gave Siri into the world. And so I get many places much more easily than I used to. But it's one thing to be poor in directions in your driving. It's quite another thing to be poor in directions in your spiritual life. Paul wants the Philippians to realize the danger of being like me in their spiritual thinking and acting, in their directional spirituality, in the direction of their thoughts, in the direction of their life. He's basically coming to them and saying, you need to be going in the right direction. You need to direct your life in the way that God wants you to go. You need to direct your thoughts. You need to direct your actions. And as you do that, God will be with you. You need to direct your life. You need to point your life in the right direction. Don't get lost, Paul might say. Don't get lost and don't be passive and don't be lazy. You can't wander about in your spiritual life wondering where you are and where you're going and how you got there. Not a wise way to follow the Lord. So this passage is all about being directionally minded in our thinking and in our actions, going in the right direction. That's what Paul's saying. And he's urging upon them, as I would imagine many of my friends would urge upon me, where are you going? Where are you looking? 
Do you know how you got here? And he would say that to our minds and our lives. Where are you going? How did you get here? How are you directing your thoughts and your actions? Are you wandering aimlessly or are you going in the right direction? This passage breaks down into a set of commands, which we might call the direction of our life. He focuses on their thought life and then their actions. That's all kind of under the same category, the direction of their life. And then it comes with the promise, the God of their life. So the direction of our lives and the God of our life. The, the most lengthy passage, obviously, is the first section of command. So we'll deal with that first, and then we'll get to the promise as we head towards our conclusions. So let's look at these, these commands at the beginning of this section, verse 8 and most of verse 9, focus on these commands, the direction of our life. And he breaks that down into the direction of our thoughts and the direction of our actions. So you notice this beginning in verse 8. Look down in your Bibles. Finally, brothers, and we don't want to skip over that word. This is Paul's reminder, subtle but affectionate reminder, that they are the family of God. They have been called together as the people of God. They've been chosen as God's children. That though these are Gentiles and Paul is a Jew, God has brought them together in Christ. And so they share a purpose in Christ with just that one word, he's communicating all of that affection and unity and, and direction and calling. Finally, brothers, he says. And we could translate it brothers and sisters. It certainly includes the men and the women that are part of this church body. Finally, brothers, whatever is, and then he goes on to list six virtues, we might call them, six qualities that they are to think about. They are to think whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. And then lest those didn't cover a sufficient gamut of good things, he throws in these comprehensive terms at the end. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, and then here's the command, think about these things. Now, what struck me in, in reading some of the really smart commentators on these words is that pretty much they mean what they seem to mean when you read them. Pretty much. So, true means things that are true, things that are righteous. Honorable means things worthy of honor. Deserving of praise means things deserving of praise. The one, one uh, kind of important distinction I would make, though, is these are not subjective qualities. This is not Paul speaking to a postmodern world and saying, look, whatever you think is beautiful is beautiful. That's not what Paul's saying. Perhaps you've heard of the, uh, the story about the person who visited the Mona Lisa and was looking at it. I assume it was there in the Louvre, and he's, he's looking at it, and he turns to a guard or somebody thereby and says, I don't like it. And the guard said, sir, these paintings are no longer being evaluated. Only the viewers are. <laughs> so if you don't like it, let me tell you who the problem has here. This, this, the problem is with you. That, that's similar to Paul's perspective here. It's, it's not as though you get to decide uh, what is excellent and what is praiseworthy. And regardless of your taste, uh, you can just enjoy those things and think about them. No, this is God's word. So one way you could maybe helpfully think about this is what kinds of things would God think are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely, commendable and excellent? Now, I, I don't think it's limited to theology, though it certainly includes that. I don't think it's limited to godly character. It certainly includes things in God's world that he's made and his artistic creation, so that certainly it is good to look at the sun and say, there is something excellent in what God has made. So this isn't limited to kind of a super spiritual list of evaluation. If you're a mathematician and you wonder, as Isaac Newton did, in the incredible complexities of the mathematical world or the physical world, that's not a bad way to, de to describe the obedience to this list. The point here is what kinds of things are praiseworthy, commendable, true, righteous, just, honorable from God's perspective and those things should be the direction of your mind. 
That is how you should direct your mind. Direct your mind toward those things in the world or in his word, either attributes that reflect God or creations that reveal God or the word that is God speaking. Those things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, anything worthy of praise, think about those things. What this is absolutely rejecting is mental passivity. This is absolutely rejecting mental passivity, the idea that Basically, our thought life should be a series of surprise stops on a train trip to nowhere. That is not God's intention for our mind. We're on a train. Where are you going? I don't know. It's a surprise. (laughs) Next stop, self-indulgence. Oh, this is a fun one. Let's get off. Next stop, bitterness station. Next stop, Worry. Next stop, entertainment. Next stop, the bills. Next stop, marriage. And if your mind is like mine, that could have been like, I don't know, eight seconds. Is that how your mind works too? Bing, 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 bing. Where are you going? I don't know. It's just whatever pops into my head. This passage is rejecting mental passivity. It's requiring mental determination, mental direction. Paul, if I, in my uh, directionlessness, uh, if Paul could come to me, if that was my spiritual way of being, he would say, where are you going? Where is your mind going? You can't just get in the car and drive around mentally. You can't just get on the train and wonder where the next stop is. No, you would say, we're called to a kind of mental direction in our life. Think about these things. Actively think about the kinds of things that God would say are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. Think about those things. And it's not a limited list. I think that's part of the reason Paul says, if there's anything. So it's, it's almost as though God says, look, I've given you almost an infinite number of good things to think about. So don't think about bad things. Now, this is not commending uh, the kind of super spiritual positivity that comes from the faith uh, movement that I think is unbiblical. That we're never to think about uh, difficult aspects of life or we're never to examine uh, even the temptations of our own heart and the cravings we have. No, 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 no. As long as we're thinking about those things from a godly perspective, they can be an edifying train of thought. This isn't encouraging a, a kind of uh, over-the-top po- positivity about, about everything. I, I've heard of someone recently who, who said they were trained that when you were sick, you just didn't think about it. You refused to think about it, and that's what faith looked like. That's ridiculous. The, the Bible commends addressing the reality of your suffering. Paul models addressing the reality of your suffering, acknowledging the existence of your sin. This, this is not some kind of positivity. It's saying, let your mind be directed in ways that God would applaud. Let your mind be directed in ways that God would applaud. Get on God's mental train and stay on it. Don't get off and go on the merry-go-round of self-centered thinking or the thinking that plagues this world that is largely subjective and self-focused. You know what they almost always have on on merry-go-rounds? Some kind of mirror. Have you ever noticed that? That's what this world's thought process is like. You have mirrors to make you look big, and mirrors to make you look skinny, and mirrors to make you look far away and grotesque and like a monster. And, and that's what this world's thought process is like. Just go round and around and around. How does this affect me? How does this affect me now? How does this affect me now? How do I feel? <laughs> My wife and I have like an inside joke because of how easy it is to start sentences, I feel like. As if that's the authoritative evaluation of anything. 
or even the most important part of the conversation, I, I feel like. Well, why don't we say, I think, I think this. And then we can evaluate whether that thinking is good or bad. That's what Paul's getting at here. He's, he's getting at the Christian saying, look, your mind is a part of God's domain. And it's meant to be a place where God's priorities are revealed. Our thoughts are not our Lord. The Lord is over our thoughts. So we're called to bring our thoughts to the Lord and think about those things that are honoring to Him. Let me tell you a, an area, when I think about this verse, of conviction for me. An area of conviction for me is how much I love to be entertained. And I, I might like a kinds of entertainment that, that you don't like. So, so I, I, kinda, I like checking on the news. Some people like you might, might like that. There's nothing wrong with checking on the news. That could be actually commendable in a, in a certain percentage, certain portion. I, I like movies. I like TV. I like having a phone that can search out different things. I, I like that. And some of those things are useful and can be edifying and good. But, but sometimes it feels more like I'm letting someone else do my thinking for me than that I'm using that to think God's thoughts after him. You know what I mean? You know the difference? Could the internet be used to bring good things to my attention? Absolutely. Could it also be used to just give me whatever they want me to think about? Yeah, it could do that too. Where I'm just saying, think for me. What should I think about today? How about this scandal? How about this news item? How about this entertaining TV show? How about this? How about this train of thought? How about this? How about this? How about this? I'm just saying, I am wide open to whatever thoughts you have for me today. I just want thoughts. Just fill my mind with whatever thoughts you have. Fictional thoughts, real thoughts, historical thoughts, interesting thoughts, scandalous thoughts. Just, just, I'm, here I am. My mind is a blank whiteboard. Just write on it. The president and the Senate and this country and that country and that star and that TV show and this issue over here and this interesting article about whatever. Now, now, could those things be things that I actively choose to use to think about excellent, praiseworthy? Yes, absolutely. But I think most of the time, I'm not going there looking for ways to think God's thoughts after him. I'm going there looking for somebody else to give me things to think about. Maybe you're like that too. Because there's a certain easiness about that, isn't it? It's sort of easier. I don't have to think. Exactly. I don't want to have to think. I think all day long. I just want, I just want, to, I just want to receive thoughts. But, but the Christian is called to be thinking, to be actively thinking, and not just thinking anything, thinking the kinds of things that God would commend, things that God thinks are lovely, things God thinks are pure and, and just and honorable and excellent and, and worthy of praise. Now, if we, we put that filter over the things that we might search out or watch on a screen, it, it, it changes the way we would evaluate them. Would, would God think this is an excellent thing for my mind right now? Would God think this is lovely and true right now? Now, we, we have different convictions about what we can watch. You, you rarely, if ever, hear me commend movies up here because we have different ways of thinking about how something could be edifying. But what I'm mostly concerned about and what Paul's mostly concerned about is if there is a kind of passive just watching without discerning, just receiving without choosing, and acting as though we are not called to think specifically those things that are honoring to the Lord. Let's think about social media. Are you aware that you're responsible for what you read? Sometimes we think that we're only responsible for what we write, which we are. The word says we'll be judged for every careless word. A, a terrifying verse in the Twitter world. 
in the publicly commenting world. Every careless word. But we're also responsible for what we read. So if we are reading things that God does not consider honorable, true, just, pure, lovely, excellent, we are neglecting our mental calling. We're we're being mentally passive recipients of thoughts that God would not consider true, honorable, just. There's not a neutrality when it comes to our mind. I'm just observing because your mind is engaged. So just something to be aware of when we're thinking Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Are these things, things that God would consider lovely, honorable, just, true, pure? Now perhaps they are, and many of them are edifying things. But sometimes we think, I'm just observing. We don't realize you're thinking when you observe. Let's consider these responsibilities. Let's consider what, what are we putting into our mind? Is there a place for entertainment? Absolutely there's a place for entertainment. Can entertainment be good and excellent? Yes. Can it also be bad and sinful and promoting of evil and normalizing Wickedness. Yes, it can. This is the filter of things we are to think about. Think about these things. And it's important to remember, God is bigger than humanity. Here's what I mean by that. One of the ways I talk to my children about the Garden of Eden, when the temptation came, is I'll point out, look at All the things that God gave for them to eat. All of these different things he could eat. They could eat anything in the garden, just not the one tree. Well, that's always the case. The good things God has given us to think upon are always more than the bad things that the world urges us to think upon and that our own flesh craves thinking upon. There's an infinite number of things that can lead to an edifying experience of soul. There's more books than can possibly be read in a lifetime. And trust me, Aaron is trying, and he can't do it. There, there's more books than possibly be read. We, we joke about you know, the stack of books we, we want to get to. If, if, if you're not sure what those books are, Come to me. I had a conversation with a member of, of a church one time. I was trying to encourage them in good reading. I said, look, I can give you a hundred books right now that are solid gold. Solid gold. So let me serve you. Uh, you don't actually, I wouldn't recommend just sort of browsing the latest, newest, you know, what's popular, what's trending. Uh, let's give it a few years and see if it is still trending. Uh, I doubt it. But there, there, you could get a hundred books that you don't even have to, um, you know, wonder about their quality or their biblical foundation or their orthodoxy, and they will edify your heart. And if you start reading now, and if you get to the end of that list, I can give you a hundred more. There's good sermons and terrible sermons on the internet. (laughs) There's good Twitter feeds and unhelpful Twitter feeds. There's good Facebook pages and unedifying Facebook pages. There's good comment threads and there's terrible comment threads. There's good websites and there's bad websites. There is an infinite number of things to study that would lead to the glorification of God. There's good edifying entertainment and there's bad entertainment. There are TV shows that are going to serve you to glorify God for their artistry and creativity and wholesomeness and there's some that are going to tempt you to think more about sinful things. That's what this passage is designed to do. It's designed to come to us and say, your mind is part of God's creation, and it's meant to be used for his glory. And so if we are putting in our mind things that drag us away from the Lord, let's stop doing that and replace those with things that will glorify him and that he would applaud. You could 
rewrite this, whatever God thinks is true, whatever God thinks is honorable, whatever God thinks is just and pure and lovely, whatever God would commend, whatever God says is excellent, whatever God says is worthy of praise, think about those things. And since there's so many of them, you won't have a lot of time to think about not terrible but mediocre things, let alone things that are terrible, whether they're mediocre or not. The direction of our mind. Direct your lives, and that includes your mind, in the right direction. And direct your life in the right direction. Notice the, he progresses, and in case there was any questioning of, well, what, can you give us an example, Paul? Yes, I can. Can you give us an example of what kinds of things you mean when you're talking about excellent, praiseworthy? Is this kind of like Greek philosophy? Should we go after Aristotle? Or are you a Plato guy? Well, who, who do you want to go with, Paul? Well, let, let, let me give you a model that's been part of my calling, Paul would say, is to show you in human form, in a non-divine human form, what it looks like to think and do and practice the right kinds of things. Verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Most likely, most likely, the two first words there, learned and received, refers to Paul's teaching, and heard and seen refers to Paul's actions. So he's talking about his doctrine, he's talking about his life. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Paul is not... Um, boasting here. He's simply modeling what every godly Christian leader from a from a, a pastor or just an individual in the church, a mature individual in the church, certainly a leader of Paul's stature, should do is to recognize that our our mouth needs to be uh, teaching good things and our life also needs to be modeling good things. So that we could actually say to those that come after us, follow my example. Let me show you how to do this. No different than the dad who teaches his son which direction to turn a screwdriver. Paul's just saying, go in this direction. Because if you go the other direction, it's bad for you. He's not boasting right now. He's simply saying, I I've shown you how to live in God's direction. I've shown you how to do it. So you don't have to sit there and wonder, if only God could have given us some kind of example. It's so hard. God is, is patient and kind. He doesn't come to us and say, be godly and leave you to your own devices about how to do that. Think the right things and doesn't tell you what those things are. Practice the right things and doesn't tell you how to do that. He's not some coach that's barking, do it right, without telling you how. No, he shows you, he tells you, and then he says, now do that. Christianity is a lot simpler than we would sometimes want to admit. It's simpler. It's not easy always, but it is simple. And actually, Paul's practice and teaching have been recorded for us in Scripture. This is, again, why I think so much of the New Testament is dedicated to Paul's personal example. If you've wondered, why all the biographical sections about Paul? Well, in God's providence, God chose Paul to be an example for the early churches and therefore an example for us. So his encouragement, his, his way of, of loving the church even in the midst of controversy, his trust in the face of difficulty, we are meant to look to Paul as an example. Now, he's not our ultimate example. We are ultimately pointed to Jesus in his humanity for his righteousness is to be the model of our righteousness. But it's also true that Jesus is human and divine and had a very unique task of atoning for our sins. And so we're also given Paul, almost more than any other leader in the New Testament, to be an example to us. He's not divine, he's not to be worshipped, but he is to be an example, and that's what he is commending to the Philippians, so that we can read his words and watch his lifestyle on the pages of Scripture, and like the Philippian church, we can practice these things. 
we can practice the doctrine he's given us. Doctrine like Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can practice and rehearse the good news he's given us. So that there is now a righteousness from God that we have come to know through Jesus Christ. We can practice those things. We can practice his commands to love others as God in Christ has loved you. Forgive others as God in Christ has forgiven you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We can practice these things. It's important to see the complementary nature of these commands. Our thoughts are meant to lead to a lifestyle which is filled with godly thinking. Our thoughts are meant to lead to a lifestyle which is filled with godly thinking. We're not meant to be mere Christian philosophers nor mere Christian activists. We're called to be acting and thinking in ways that are pleasing to the Lord. Direct your life, Paul would say. Practice these things. Practice them. What's the main thing you get out of this whole passage? Where are you going? Go in the right direction. So let's ask ourselves. Are we going in the right direction? Mentally and practically. Are we? How are we? Let's celebrate where God has been at work. How are we going in the right direction? Let me give you an encouragement that's happening right now. Right now, you are going in the right direction. Because you are sitting in a church, one of many in this area, we're not the only one, that preaches God's word. That is going in the right direction mentally and practically. That is practicing what Paul said to practice. The Christian life is not impossible. It's not as though we're supposed to preach these things. You're supposed to say, well, yet another message that I never do. No, that's not true. You're doing it right now. Right now, you're putting your mind on the things of God. Right now, you're sitting in a chair that's part of the gathering of God's people. I suspect that you do this many times in the week. I, Do you read your Bible during the week? Well, then you are thinking God's thoughts after him. Have you ever thanked the Lord for some ordinary moment in the day? Lord, thank you for this this wonderful weather we're having. Thank you for that sprinkling of rain. Well, then you're thinking God's thoughts after him. Have you ever celebrated progress in your child in some godly way? Well, then you're thinking God's thoughts after him. Have you ever loved your wife or your husband or or invited someone over for hospitality? Well, then you're practicing the kinds of things that Paul would encourage you to practice. You, You are doing these things. Of course, it's always good to ask, where are we not doing that? I think one way that we could grow and that I think I could grow in this area is simply by asking that question and answering it honestly in a quiet moment before the Lord. Knowing that he loves us and he cares about us and that he forgives all of our sins and that he's taking us home just asking that question and not assuming that because you've been a Christian for many years and have heard umpteen messages that you're probably doing it fine. Ask the question. We all are prone to passivity, to wandering instead of going, to not knowing which door we came in. We are all prone to that spiritually. Where am I right now? Ask the question, honestly, is there any part of my life that I am not setting and pursuing a godly direction, either in my thinking or my actions? I'm not talking about those areas that you know and you're battling. So last week we talked about the importance of joy. And you might be one of those who, man, for you, that command is hard. It's hard to fight for joy. And you're fighting for joy, and it's, it is just a battle every day, and you, you labor and labor and labor, and you're convicted of sin, and you try again, you're convicted of sin, and you try again. Listen, that's normal. Many of us struggle in those ways. I'm not so much speaking to those struggles that we know about. I'm talking about those areas of life 
that maybe we haven't thought about in years. That we've just decided, I'm just going to wander in that area of my life. I'm just like a person wandering around the woods. That part of my life has me with my eyes closed, wandering from tree trunk to tree trunk, not sure how to get home. And frankly, I'm okay with that because I'm busy over here. What are those areas of life? What areas of your spiritual life look like a person just driving in a roundabout, not sure which turn to take, over and over? And, and it's just been that way forever. When I do Christmas shopping, most of the time, what I look like is a crazy person. Because I go to the store, and I have no idea. So I just wander around. And I'm, I'm sure the workers at some point begin, to, because they see me again. <laughs> Weren't you just here? How many times do you need to look at that shirt? It hasn't changed. But I come back because I'm, I'm not sure, and I kind of wander. And not now, is that necessary for a husband who's weak and limited in many ways? Yeah. Is that good for a Christian? No. What part of your life are you just sort of wandering? Oh, yeah, my marriage. Yeah, that's not good. This area of Internet activity. I don't know. Something should change. Something, I don't know. Family devotions. That's hard. You know what I mean? Like, there's just sort of a wandering. It's not terrible mentality. Paul is urging a, an intentionality about life here. You could think about times in the day where you're particularly prone to this. Maybe it's in the morning. Maybe in the morning you're prone to having maybe anxious thinking about your day. And it's an area of your life that hasn't been intentionally submitted to the Lord or directed to the Lord. Or maybe you're like me and you like sleep. And so sleep is sometimes a bigger deal than meeting with the Lord. Or maybe, maybe for you it's at the night, and you just indulge an anxious, worrisome train of thought at night. And your thinking is, well, if I just think about all my worries long enough, eventually I'll run out and I'll go to sleep. doesn't work. Where in your life is there just sort of a, a just doing life instead of directing life? Where would that be for you? Come up with an area right now. Let me encourage you. Let me, let me urge you right now. What's an area where there's just sort of a, a passivity, a spiritual directionlessness? You're like, like me in one of those departments where I was just wandering around. No idea where I'm supposed to go. I don't even know where things are. It's how I feel about Ikea all the time. I have no idea what, what the thought process. I just wander, follow the yellow road. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where things are. There's dressers and chairs next to spoons and bowls, and I don't have any idea where I am right now. Christian life is not meant to be that way. Think about these things. Practice these things. A baseball coach does not gather the team and say, there's the bats, there's the balls. Just run around aimlessly and throw things at each other. No, there is a practicing. There is a thinking. There is an intentionality about these things. We go to our spiritual store to get something. We go in a direction. We drive towards a destination and spiritually there are areas of life that all of us are not doing that where we should. Where is that for you? Is it your marriage? Is it your parenting? Is it your family discipleship? Is it your reading maybe? Has it been years since you read through a whole book? Is it your Bible reading? Is it your, your, when you wake in the morning? Is it when you go to sleep at night? Maybe it's in the mundane aspects of life that your thoughts just run towards complaining. What's an area that you're just going in the roundabout? A baseball team in the field just throwing bats and balls and running around. Me wandering through the store. What's an area that looks kind of like that and needs some direction? Paul's saying, think about these things in that moment. What do you need to think about in those moments? What do you need to practice in those moments? There's a, a direction of life that Paul is urging. And with that direction, there is a promise. 
There is an assurance, which is the second point. The first is the direction of our life. The second is the God of our life. The God of our life. Look down at your passage. What happens along the way as we are going in this direction? What do we know? What are we assured of? God, and he calls himself here, the God of peace will be with you. I, I, this is speculation, but I wonder if when Paul concluded the preceding passage where he says, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, what came to his mind was, I, I don't want them thinking that prayer means a kind of mental passivity. There is something we can do with our minds. There is something we can do with our lives. We're not to be anxious, but we are to be thinking God's thoughts after him and practicing godliness in our daily lives. And it's also in doing that that we encounter the God of peace. Peace comes through prayer, yes. Peace also comes as we are pursuing and thinking in ways that are honoring to the Lord and practicing things that are godly. Now, is, is God in his grace with us even when we disobey? Yes. But do we experience his nearness in a particular way when we are obeying him? Yes. How are both of those true? I don't know. But this this promise is in some way connected to the command. It's not just a random phrase. Oh, and by the way, God, the God of peace will be with you. No, no there, there is something in that as we are thinking about him and as we are directing our lives towards him, he promises that he, as the God of peace, will be with us. So let's go back to that part in your life where you're wandering around the store looking clueless. Where is that right now? I have them too. We all have them. Where is that for you right now? Listen, here's the promise. As you begin to take direction, it will feel scary. It'll feel strange. It'll feel like work. It'll feel like I've never been this way before. I don't really know for sure how this is going to work. You'll drive slowly. Here's what God's saying. I'm with you, and my peace is with you. Because when you start taking direction in an area that you've been directionless, you feel vulnerable because you're not very good at it. I'm not very good at it. It's not like those things where we know exactly where we're going and we know all the turns and the shortcuts and we're very good at it. When we start taking action in areas that we're not good at, we feel weak and vulnerable. So how kind of the Lord to remind his people, I am with you. As you take steps mentally in this particular direction to stop thinking cynically and in a complaining way and to start thinking in a thankful way, to stop entertaining yourself and letting other people do your thinking for you and start actively thinking, oh, your flesh is going to rebel against that. It's going to be hard. Can't I just watch my show? Here's what God's saying. I'm with you. I will give you peace. Peace. Well, that's just what I do. I just go to bed at night and I rehearse all of the burdens that I have. And once I've gone through them all four times, then I can go to sleep. And he says, well, why don't you try focusing on my faithful provision at the end of the night? I don't, I don't know if I could do that. I'll be with you with my peace. But I, I, like, I like television and it helps me unwind. How much are you watching? I don't know, maybe four hours. Do you feel more spiritually rested when it's done? No, I'm just exhausted and I go to sleep. I have done that, okay? I'm not speaking to anybody else other than me. I've done that. What would it look like for me to focus on something that would be excellent, praiseworthy, noble? It would feel really uncomfortable. The God of peace will be with you. I'm just used to complaining. It's just the way I am. It's the way my parents were, my grandparents, my great aunt Matilda. We're all complainers. I don't know how to not be a complainer. I don't know how to communicate without complaining. The God of peace will be with you. I'm terrible at encouragement. I am just so bad at it. I try, and it's like I forget English. You're very good at this. That's all I had to say to you today. <laughs> the God of peace will be with you. What a promise. Take steps out of the roundabout, merry-go-round of non-excellent thinking 
and non-Christian direction. If you're a dad that's never taken leadership of family devotions, what's the first thing you're going to feel when you start doing that? Weak. Lame. Boring. I guarantee the first time you try to do it, most of your children won't listen and your wife will look like she's terrified at how lame this is right now. Now, wives, please don't do that. But, but you can think that that's the experience. Oh, she's not liking this right now. You're going to feel weak. Thus the promise the God of peace will be with you. I, I can't tell you where this area is, but I'll guarantee for every Christian here, there's some area in your life where your spiritual life is on the wandering roundabout of going nowhere and not knowing where you are. You're me, just wandering around the building. Oh, that's not the door. Where's the door? I don't, I don't know. Don't stay there. Pick an area and begin directing it Godward. And here's God's promise. I will be with you. I'll give you peace. I might not make you great at it right away, but I'll give you peace. I'll be with you on the journey. Listen, this peace promise is precious because peace is part of what God sent Jesus to give us. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples in that upper room, and they've been, you know, there they are, wondering, doubting, not sure, anxious. You know what he said? Peace be to you. Peace doesn't just mean a warm, fuzzy feeling. It has to do with the, the Old Testament idea of shalom. It's God's blessing and kindness and goodness and care for his people. His, his assurance that he will watch over them and will bring them to blessing. That's the idea here. It's God's personal promise of his favor directed towards you as you take these trembling steps in a new direction. Brothers and sisters, the God of peace will be with you because the Prince of Peace died to change God's anger against us for our sin to favor towards us because of Christ's righteousness. The Prince of Peace experienced the condemnation of God so that the people of God could experience the peace of God as they head in the direction of God. This is what Jesus died to give us. Access to the God of peace. This is what Jesus removed our record of sins to give us. Proximity to the God of peace. To go and stay in the roundabout is worse than just disobedience. It's neglecting the very gift that Jesus died to give us, the active pursuit of and dependence on the God of peace. Sinners can experience the nearness of the God of peace because Jesus died for their sin. This is the effect of the gospel. So let me encourage you, start in a direction. Pick one area. Don't pick 12. Pick one area of your thought life or your practice that you've been going around the roundabout, maybe for years, maybe forever. Start in a direction. I guarantee you will feel weak and vulnerable. Start in a direction. And remember, because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross and resurrection, the God of peace will be with you. Direct your life in your thoughts in the right way. And the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bring to you the wandering parts of our mental or practical life right now. Or those areas of plateau, those areas of passivity, we bring them to you. And we thank you for this word 
that you are speaking to us in that area. And I pray, Lord, that you would cause us to take a direction towards you. Lord, I pray for those who battle mental distraction and anxiety. I pray you would cause them to cultivate a sense of your nearness, confidence in you as they seek to fight for thoughts in your direction. Lord, I pray, Lord, just a burden on my heart for dads, that for them, the major area here is, is this area of discipleship, and their thoughts there are discouraging to them and worrisome and anxious. I pray you would bring their thoughts under submission to your power and your purpose for their life, and you would cause them, Lord, to take steps of faith and that you would reassure them of your peace. Lord, thank you for your peace. Thank you for the price that was paid for it, and thank you for the promise of it. We're grateful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.